Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Eve Zimmerman. Uh, I'm the new director of the Newhouse Center for the Humanities. Um, I'm also a faculty member in East Asian Languages and Cultures. So I'm very pleased to welcome you here today. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Min Jin Lee to Wellesley College. Educated at Yale and originally trained as a lawyer, Min turned her hand to fiction with her first novel, Free Food for Millionaires, in 2007. Her latest work, Pachinko, dates to 2017 and was a finalist for the National Book Award and chosen as one of the best books of 2017 by the New York Times. Recipients of fellowships from the Guggenheim and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, Lee will soon take a post as writer in residence at Amherst College. But please allow me some anecdotal evidence from our own campus to characterize the reception of Pachinko more broadly. Sandra Chung, where are you? Yep. <laughs> Member of the Korean Students Association first suggested that we invite Min to celebrate the beginning of our academic year. And thank you, KSA. Carrying Pachinko into my first class this fall, a first year student, and normally they're very shy, couldn't contain her excitement and burst out, Professor, have you read Pachinko? <laughs> Before I taught one small reading group, uh, I sat in my office listening to the discussion going on next door in the lounge about Pachinko. Did they need me at all, I wondered. And the answer was no. I haven't seen students become so excited by historical fiction, well, ever to tell the truth. And we've gotten an enthusiastic response from faculty and staff on this campus as well. I am going to leave it to Professor Eugene Ko of the English Department to unpack some of the reasons for Wellesley's enthusiasm. I want to thank the English Department for co-sponsoring this event with the Newhouse Center and Professor Ko personally for agreeing to serve as discussant. An expert on the modern performance varieties of Shakespeare, Professor Ko has written extensively on the subject and he is a firm believer in interactive education learning by doing. This semester, he's teaching a course, Writers of Color Across the Globe. I also want to thank Sun Hee Lee, Chair of the East Asian Languages and Cultures Department, who organized our lively open class session this morning. So uh, just a word on how we're going to proceed today. Um, Min has agreed to read us a short piece from Pachinko Passage. Um, and then Professor Ko has some questions he will put to Min uh, and they will discuss them. At the end, we're going to have an open uh, question and answer session from you with a, the first couple of questions uh, that have been already been chosen by faculty. So that's it. Without further ado, I present Min Jin Lee to you. Thank you very much. Good evening. I think it's evening. It's almost evening. Um, I'm so happy to be here at Wellesley because some of my favorite people in the world have graduated from your school. And they're not here today, but they're really thrilled that I'm representing and they told me all over Facebook. <laughs> I also want to thank Eve and the Newhouse Center and Sun Hee and Pryujin for spending time with me today. I want to thank you, but I also want to take uh, in particular, I want to thank Lauren, who has done so much heavy lifting for this event. And I want to just thank you for all the work that you've done. I think she's been here since 3 o'clock setting up this stage. This wouldn't have happened without Lauren, so thank you. I also want to thank all the students who are here today and the faculty members. I always feel a bit weird when I'm in colleges because I didn't do very well in college. <laughs> like, I went to college. I did. <laughs> I went to college and it was fine. It was fine. <laughs> but my favorite parts were actually these kinds of events whenever guests would come because they weren't part of my classes and they weren't graded so I didn't have to do any homework for them. 
which was good, because I was usually so busy thinking about boys and nonsense like that, and you know, with my drama and my roommates. But now that I'm here, I can't believe I'm actually here on the other side. So I just want to thank you for, I don't know, tolerating this person being here. I'm only going to read very, very, very briefly, about six or seven minutes. And I talked about my readings, because I have a couple of them that I choose from. And I wanted to choose this one in particular because lately I have been noticing this really interesting thing that's happening with kimchi. Because when, for those of you who are Korean here, um, or and for those of you who are acquainted with kimchi, kimchi is considered this kind of embarrassing part of our culture because it has a really strong odor. I think it's really delicious. And I just want you to know that lately the paleo people have discovered it. <laughs> and now it's good for you because it's fermented. So. I wanted to reclaim kimchi and talk about the pride. I'm going to read a little bit of the book very, very early on. And in this section, you really need to know only one character, Sanja. She is a young woman. She has two little boys that she needs to provide for. It's 1939, and we're in Osaka. So I hope that we could do what we readers do best. I hope that we can imagine. So here we are, 1939. It's Osaka, not beautiful Wellesley. Her first day of selling took place one week after Isak was jailed. And after Sanja dropped off Isak's food at the jail, she wheeled a wooden cart holding a large clay jar of kimchi to the market. And the open air market in Ikaino was a patchwork of modest retail shops selling housewares, cloth, tatami mats, and electric goods. And it hosted a collection of hawkers, like her, who had peddled homemade scallion pancakes, rolled sushi, and soybean paste. And nearby the peddlers selling gochujang and denjang, Sanja noticed two young Korean women selling fried wheat crackers. So Sanja pushed her cart toward them, hoping to wedge herself between the cracker stall and the tenjang lady. You can't stink up our area, the cracker lady said. Go to the other side. And she pointed to the fish section. And when Sanja moved closer to the women selling dried anchovies and seaweed, the older Korean women there were even less welcoming. If you don't move your shitty looking cart, I will have my sons piss in your pots, country girl. Do you understand? Said the tall woman wearing the white kerchief on her head. And Sanja couldn't come up with a ready reply because she was so surprised. And none of them were even selling kimchi. And Denjang could smell just as pungently. So she kept walking until she couldn't see any more ajamas. And she ended up near the train station entrance where the live chickens were sold. And the intense funk of animal carcasses overwhelmed her. And there was space just big enough for her cart between the pig butcher and the chickens. Wielding an enormous knife, a Japanese butcher was cutting up a hog the size of a child. And a large bucket filled with its blood rested by his feet. And two hogs' heads lay on the front table. And the butcher was an older gentleman with ropey muscular arms and thick veins. And he was sweating profusely. And he smiled at her. Kimchi. Delicious kimchi. Try this delicious kimchi. And never make it at home again. And pass her his pie. Turned to look at her. And Sanja, mortified, looked away. And no one bought anything. And after the butcher 
finished with his hog, he washed his hands, and he gave her 25 sen. And Sanja filled a container for him, and he didn't seem to mind that she didn't speak hardly any Japanese. He put down the kimchi container by the hogsheads, and he reached behind the stall, and he took out his bento. And the butcher placed a piece of kimchi neatly on top of his white rice. And with his chopsticks, he took a bite. Oishi, honto oishi, oishi desu. And Sanja bowed to him. And at lunchtime, Kyung Hee, her sister-in-law, brought Moses for her to nurse. And Sanja remembered that she had no choice but to recoup the cost of her cabbage, her radish, and her spices. And at the end of the day, she had to show more money than they had spent. And Kyung Hee watched the cart while Sanja nursed a baby with her body turned toward the wall. I'd be afraid, Kyung Hee said. You know how I said, I want to be the kimchi ajima? I don't think I realize what it would feel like to stand here. You are so brave. What choice do we have? Sanja said, looking down at her beautiful baby. Sanjaya, do you want me to stay here with you and wait with you? You'll get in trouble. Brother will get mad, Sanja said. You should be home when Noah gets back from school and you have to make dinner. I'm sorry I can't help you, sister. Oh, what I have to do is easy, Kyung Hee said. It was almost two o'clock in the afternoon, and the air was cooler as the sun turned away from them. I'm not going to come home until I sell the whole jar, Sanja said. Really? Sanja's baby Moses resembled Isaac. He looked nothing like Noah, who was olive-skinned with thick, glossy hair. And Noah's bright eyes noticed everything. And except for his mouth, Noah looked almost identical to the young Hansu. And at school, Noah sat still during his lessons, and he waited for his turn, and he was praised as an excellent student. Noah had been an easy baby, and Moses was a happy baby, too delighted to be put into a stranger's arms. And when she thought about how much she loved her boys, she recalled her parents, and Sanja felt so far away from them. And now she was standing outside of a rumbling train station, trying to sell kimchi. There was no shame in her work, but it couldn't be what they had wanted for her. But nevertheless, she felt her parents would have wanted her to make money, especially now. And when Sanja finished nursing, Kyung Hee put down two sugared rolls and a bottle filled with, re with reconstituted powdered milk on the cart. Sanjaya. You have to eat. You're nursing, and that's not easy, right? You have to drink lots of water and milk. And Kyung Hee turned around so Sanja could tuck Moses onto the sling on Kyung Hee's back. And Kyung Hee secured the baby tightly around her slim torso. I'll go home and wait for Noah and make dinner. And you come home soon, okay? We're a good team. And Moses' small head 
rested beneath Kyung Hee's thin, narrow shoulders. And Sanja watched them walk away. And when they're out of earshot, Sanja cried out, Kimchi! Delicious kimchi! Kimchi! Delicious kimchi! Oishi des! Oishi des! Honto oishi! And this sound, the sound of her own voice, felt familiar, not because it was her own voice, but because it reminded her of all the times that she had gone to the market as a girl, first with her father, and later by herself as a young woman, and then as a lover yearning for the gaze of her beloved. And the chorus of women working and hawking had always been with her. And now she had joined them. Kimchi, kimchi, delicious kimchi, homemade kimchi, better than your grandmother's. The most delicious kimchi in Ikaino. And she tried to sound cheerful because back home she had always frequented the nicest ajumas. And when the passersby glanced in her direction, she bowed and she smiled at them. Oishi das, honto oishi, kimchi das. And the pig butcher looked up from his counter and he smiled at her proudly. And that evening, Sanja did not go home until she could see the bottom of the kimchi jar. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful reading. Oh, thank you. I'm famished. <laughs> I want to go home now and start eating some kimchi. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Now, so I will start off the questioning and then we'll open it up uh, afterwards. Uh, so I'll begin by <coughs> pointing out or letting people know, reminding you that you've talked very movingly about how your father lost his family at the age of 16 because of the Korean War and how this kind of trauma is, as you say, an unspoken legacy for so many first and second generation immigrants. And you've spoken equally movingly of how drawn you are uh, to the strength and grace that such people live their lives with um, as they endure this legacy. And so it's in this connection that I'd like to ask you about Pachinko, where so many of the characters harbor uh, some kind of a, a traumatic legacy like this. Now, yes, um, they display amazing resilience and grace, but there's also the sense that at another level, they continue to live compromised and even emotionally incomplete lives, as though uh, somehow uh, a sense of lack was inevitable. Noah commits suicide. Solomon joins the pachinko industry despite his fancy education. Sonja simply returns to Kyunghee at the end of the novel. So can you talk a little bit about the sense of incompletion that accompanies the characters despite that, that grace and strength and resilience that they display? That's a great question. And I think the whole idea of grace doesn't exist without harm, right? You wouldn't feel grace, and you wouldn't see resilience unless you have challenges and opposition. So for me, I studied Koreans, and I guess other people have connected their lives with the, with the very tragic history of Korea, this very amazing little peninsula that is geographically trapped in a difficult contest of powers. So it isn't necessarily always that Korea is so unique, except for the fact that because of its geography, it will always be in the interest of major powers around the world. 
And consequently, Korea has had this 5,000-year history, much of which filled with exploitation, invasion. And then you have these people on this land who have had to endure all these inequities that they didn't create because of their land. And then you have the diaspora, where people like you and I, by the way, Eugene and I are both from Queens. Anybody here from Queens? Thank you, thank you. Our people are here, Eugene. <laughs> um, so here we are, like we, we end up in this beautiful place, Wellesley, Massachusetts. We grew up in Queens, New York. Our parents are from somewhere else, and you and I were actually born in Korea. So we have this legacy, and yet somehow within ourselves, I'm going to posit that we are carrying this trauma. We have this intergenerational trauma and the experience of what our parents endured and also what we're going through. So you have Asian American identity, which is so informed by our foreign histories and also a post-colonial history, which we're experiencing. And so even if we have young parents, like so for the undergraduates here who have parents basically our age, they didn't experience colonialism, not directly. However, they have family members who might have experienced colonialism and consequently their sense of incompleteness because you can't finish the thing that you never made. That's the thing, it's like if you're invaded in any way, interpersonally or as a society, you didn't make this thing, but somehow you have to fix it, repair it, get outside of it, and what will you do? And I think that in terms of this plot of the novel, my characters are constantly going like, okay, what do I do next? What can I make the best of it? And some people internalize all this inequity and others work around it and some give up. I think incompleteness is a condition that all of us experience existentially. It's incredibly difficult. And what's interesting to me as I get older, and if there are any biologists or geneticists here, I'm curious about temperament. Because some people can take that incompleteness and say, I want more. And some people just say, it'll never be enough. So it becomes a situation where personality is determined. So you can all start with the exact same situation, but people respond to it so dramatically differently. So that's interesting to me as I get older. Uh, that's terrific. It's an enlightening a answer. But now I'd like to follow up that question uh, with maybe a more challenging question. Really? It's getting harder. Okay. <laughs> I said I didn't do well in school, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and some of you in the audience will know that this week in Korea, they celebrated the holiday of Chuseok, which is the Harvest Moon Festival and very similar to Thanksgiving, which means that millions of people in Korea went home to spend some time with the, with the holidays, which also means that uh, the, the gatherings were filled with tension. Largely because, because the older oh, not my family. <laughs> largely because the older generation would ask, especially of women, uh, very inappropriate questions. When are you getting married? Uh, when are you going to have children? Um, but just recently, in, in one of the newspapers, in the Korean newspapers, it was reported that this particular Chuseok may have been even more fraught than usual because of the backdrop of the Me Too movement, which caught fire in Korea. And some young women especially were said to have said that they were going to bring Me Too home at Chuseok this time. And the target of their anger was the idealized woman of the long-suffering mother. Now, <clears throat> I know Sanja is a very complicated character. Uh, and I know you've said that uh, you, don't, you think of your novel as having multiple centers of interest. But in many ways, she is the emotional center of the novel. But she's the, the, the ideal of that long-suffering, self-sacrificing mom. You like to comment on uh, that image, that enduring image, especially in the context of a changing Korea uh, where feminism and, and the Me Too movement have really taken hold. Well, I'm a feminist and I have my Me Too stories, probably like every woman in this group. 
And one of the things that I think is interesting to me about Pachinko is that Sanja, even though she is actually long-suffering, in her mind, she thinks that she really resents this idea that you have to have all this kozang. Kozang is a Korean word for suffering. Because wherever I went to when I was interviewing for this book, the women would say to me, women have to suffer. It's your lot to suffer. You just have to suffer, suffer, suffer. And you're like, oh, more suffering. <laughs> no more suffering. I'm tired of it. Where's the luxury? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like, there was like a kind of like a resentment after a while because you're constantly being told. So I think that when these young women in Korea are saying enough, they're going to say it and they're going through kind of a, I want to say almost a phase, a, a kind of transition, which I think is pretty healthy. In the same way when I meet women all the time in America, kind of like after the first wave of feminism, the second wave of feminism, you had the sense of like, I'm not going to cook anymore. I'm not going to cook, I'm not going to clean, I'm not going to do X, Y, and Z, and yet somehow that all that work has to get done. So if you look at America, the 21st century, we want to believe that we have arrived and we have more rights. However, if you look at the actual division of labor in your home, homes, I'm curious as to see how much is equal. And when we look at Korea, we think of this other country that must be a little backwards, where women are suffering more. But in fact, I want to argue that a lot of these young women, they're kind of working around these conditions and saying, I'm not going to get married. I'm not going to have children. I'm not going to have more than one child. And the other thing that I saw, which was really strange to me, is that people are a bit, because the social strictures and censures against Korean women and sexuality are so strong, even now, in terms of reputation, people have double lives. I've met many women who are Korean and Korean American who have these kind of double lives. <laughs> so what they say, and this, they have this kind of compartmentalized existence where they do one thing in front of their family and another thing in, in their personal lives. And that may seem duplicitous, but actually I think they're just working around the problems of patriarchy. No, uh, thank you. Now, can I pick up on that uh, phrase, double lives, yeah. and, and ask a follow-up question? Now, um, as someone who came to America during elementary school, um, uh, <clears throat> lived in Elmhurst, Queens, went to school in New Haven, but still did sales on the streets of New York, spent uh, a, a lot of time in the 80s and in Korea. What are the sales of New York? What does that mean? <laughs> Did sales like the, uh, selling things in, in, in New York? Uh, Did your parents have a store? No, I, I sold uh, vacuum cleaners and, and um, dictionaries. No way. Way. Wow. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so you stole my punchline, which is we've led identical lives. We're actually the same person. <laughs> <laughs> We both came to America during elementary school. We went to school in New Haven. Uh, we have family in New York, a dysfunctional family in my case, uh, in, in and around New York. We all have dysfunctional families. Yes. <laughs> That's what makes us so charming. <laughs> <laughs> so the question that I wanted to ask you in relation to your mention of double lives is how your experience as an immigrant uh, informed the, the picture of, of Koreans in Japan, and in particular whether the picture of discrimination that we have uh, in colonial and post-colonial Japan reflects or differs from the experience you had uh, as someone growing up in, in Queens. The worst things that have happened to me in America are nothing compared to what the Korean Japanese have suffered institutionally. I never had, as a Korean American, in my personal experience, where I felt my government was against me. Now, that's different for people who might have experienced the Chinese Exclusion Act or the internment camps. But as a Korean American, I didn't experience those between the years of 1976 to 2018. Even if you look at the long history, I guess the worst thing that we can say as Koreans as, is how the United States was so instrumental in dividing the nation in the parallel because that's what happened. It was um, two American young guys who had never been to Korea who divided the country in half. <laughs> it's true, Dean Acheson was one of them. Anyway, and then um, you also have the prevalence of the US military in Korea, and that's a very controversial topic. But having said that, I guess for me, 
when I spoke to the Korean Japanese, I felt like a Labrador retriever. By that I mean, I, I felt like Korean Americans are so friendly and bouncy compared to the Korean Japanese who are very serious. And I guess they had to be really serious because so many weird things had happened to them. And the, there are three different kinds of Korean Japanese for those of you who don't know. There are North Korean Korean Japanese, there are South Korean Korean Japanese, and there are Japanese citizens who are Korean Japanese. And all three have different personalities and different groups, different values and different ethics. So when I would interview them, they would behave differently because they didn't know what to make of me, this Korean American who had this very elite education. So even though I might have had some working class experiences, their attitude is like, we don't know where to locate you. And that was for me a very interesting thing about the diaspora, that, that how we've all ended up in such different places. Like I've met Koreans from Brazil, you know, Central America, all these places, and we're all really, really different. But the Korean Japanese, the government did things that were so unspeakably difficult toward them. So for example, during the colonial era, the Korean Japanese who are on the land of Japan had Japanese citizenship. And for whatever that's worth, it had the protections of being a Japanese citizen. After the war, they were stripped of their citizenship. So they became stateless. So imagine being born in a country and you're stateless. And you try to go back home if you want to go back home and the government says to you, and at that point it's SCAP, which is a US government taking over Japan. They're telling you that you're limited in the funds that you could take back. So maybe you don't want to just like take $50 back. Maybe you have assets worth $1,000. So how could you leave? And if you do go back, there might be cholera and dysentery and everything is broken down so you can't go back home. So all these things are in operation. And, and, and of course, you have the experience of the hibakusha the people who are exposed to radiation. So many tens of thousands of Koreans died during Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And they were not the enemy of the state, but they died and they had absolutely no reparations because they were not Japanese citizens, because they lost their citizenship. So this kind of stuff that happened to the Korean Japanese and the legacy of it, and there's a lot more, for example, the fingerprinting, which is detailed in the book. And I was so struck by how they still really worked around their difficult situations. And I think that for me, the reason why I can feel much more joy and optimism is because I was treated so well in Queens. I mean, I don't know what your experience was like, but I've had friends from Asian Americans who are different parts of the country where they had very difficult time. I did not. I, I survived. <laughs> And, you know, I will survive is the anthem of Wellesley. Right. 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 <laughs> but, but now, now we're, going to, we're now going to turn to uh, people in the audience. And we have two prepared questions, one from Sandra Chung and then another from Jessica Shen. And then we'll open it up to everybody uh, <clears throat> on the floor. Hi, so my name is Sandra Chung. I'm currently a junior majoring in international relations. One of the things that I wanted to ask you about, so in Pachinko, Noah and Isak seem to have similarities rather than Hansu and Noah, even though Noah and Hansu are actual biological, like father and son. So I was just wondering about um, the reason for these character developments. So Sandra's question is, why is Noah more like his well, as, a, as they say in the street, logical father versus his biological father. <laughs> and the reason why I'm positing that question is one of the things that I really want you to, all, for all of us to think about is what makes you a parent and who is your true parent? And part of that has to do with the fact that you have to choose your parent. So even though you have these biological parents, as a child, you have to ask yourself, do I choose them? Because what I see around the country and around the world is very often children reject their parents. And they might have very good reason. Like, I don't know. Some, it depends. Or they might have very bad reasons for rejecting their parents. And Noah chooses Isaac because Isaac is a good person. And that's not a bad reason to choose someone to be your dad. So even though Isaac chose Noah by marrying Sanja, Noah chooses him back. 
And that's why it makes it that much more painful when he realizes that his biological father is someone who is morally suspect. And I think to reject your parent because he is morally suspect is something that I have to think about. Like, I'm not going to tell you how you should feel about your parents. But I do think that it's something to be said that even parents are constantly facing the gaze of their children looking at us and with the decisions that we've made. And as a parent myself, I think about that all the time, like, where, where am I messing up? And what, when, what's the judgment? And what do I have to pay for this? Because there are consequences. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jessica Shen. I'm a sophomore planning to major in English. Uh, I wanted to ask, are there any books that you think that Pachinko is in conversation with? Yes, there are so many books. But this is a weird answer. I'm actually having a conversation with the Bible. I'm constantly having a conversation with the Bible as a very seminal text that I'm always considering because I'm angry at the Bible and yet I also think that in terms of as an influence it is the most important book to me uh, you know as you know Shakespeare was tremendously influenced by histories the Bible and Ovid most of Western literature has been affected by the Bible and I started to read the Bible very seriously when I first started to be a writer it wasn't for religious reasons. So I read that Willa Cather read the Bible as a child. I mean, I'm sorry, as soon as she started writing fiction. So before she would write fiction, she would read the Bible and then she would continue her work. So when I quit being an attorney, I decided that I needed to have some sort of routine. So I thought that I'll do what Willa Cather did because I wanted to write like her. It's actually that simple. <laughs> and then now I have this really weird habit where I can't start my work without reading the Bible. So after I read it, I'll usually pick out a verse or something that I find that I'm having issues with. And I try to think about these metaphysical questions that these, this work is presenting to me. I have been profoundly affected by George Eliot's Middlemarch. Um, the other one is Cousin Bet by Balzac, Madame Bovary, obviously Anna Karenina, uh, Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy. All these 19th century folks are really important to me. I was talking to Eve earlier today about how much I love the Bronte sisters. And I used to like Jane Eyre more, but now I like Wuthering Heights more. You know, so, but, but all those authors were affected by the Bible too. So for me, I'm just kind of like taking a shortcut, which I guess I got through Willa Cather. So for those of you who are writers, I would never dismiss the Bible as a, some, as a seminal text. Like, it would be almost impossible to understand most of Western literature without understanding the Bible. Yes, absolutely. No, no, you're right. Yeah. So I was really interested because I saw the 2016 movie, The Handmaiden. Sure. I had a part of the movie. Which is based on a Western story, right? The Fingersmith, yeah. Yeah. But it also has this very positive, very feminist feel to it. And so it's really interesting to see that there's another kind of literary movie that is based on the Well, I think that what you're saying is so important because I like being Western. Like, I am Korean American and I feel like a very Western person. I'm steeped in Western culture and even at a women's college like Wellesley, 
you know, premier academic institution in the world. Whether we like it or not, we know a lot about white men. <laughs> I mean, these institutions were created, not Wellesley, but higher education was created for white men. And initially in the, in the United States, it was created for ministers, right? That is the history, intellectual history of the West. So now that you know that, at the same time, like, so that's interesting. But what I find really curious to me is in that ethos, there is an enormous amount of hope and redemption and also, if you look in this kind of Western tradition of Aristotle, because I'm kind of obsessed with Aristotle's poetics, in order to draw a story, and he talks about tragedy, which is a play, but you know, which is analogous to what I do in novel writing and what you do, Marilyn, what you have to look at is characters must have recognition and reversal. So you have a moment when the character realizes something and that there's got to be a change. And in the West, we demand it. It's, like it's imprinted in your brain. So ever since you were three and you were starting to look at picture books, you've been reading that formula of recognition reversal as a Western person. And of course, so I can't help but to create stories in that vein. So when I was in Asia and I was interviewing all these Korean Japanese and I was feeling pretty sad because I would just hear this constant refrain of shogunai, which means it can't be helped. It can't be helped, shogunai, shogunai. Like you would see, you know, you'd go like, well, why can't we do that? It's like, mm, can't be helped, just the way it is. I mean, Americans don't think that way. We're like, let's fix that. <laughs> let's get a committee, let's get a petition, let's have a <laughs> GoFundMe. I mean, like, there's a kind of impulse to fix things. And I'm talking about ways to go around the law. And of course, I'm trained as a lawyer, so I, my attitude is you can go to court. You mess with me, I'm gonna take you to court. Like I, I actually know that there are different ways that we could get redress for certain grievances. And of course that affects the way I think about story because I need to have a change. So after having met all these Korean Japanese and seeing their lives, I had to look really hard at what they were saying versus what they were doing. And what they were doing was what all people do around the world. We're just trying to make it better by the end of the day. And we are trying desperately to try to have more things for our children. And that is cross-cultural. So that's not a Western idea. But what was interesting to me was that in Asia, what people said was different than what they did. And very often, they would expect a great deal more misery. Like in a way, in the West, we have no tolerance for misery. Like someone brings up a sad topic, they're like, eh, I don't want to talk about it, right? But, in, but basically, even in Europe, Africa, the Americas, and in Asia, people will talk about miserable things. They expect misery. So it's not just Korea that we have suffering. Suffering is something that happens to everybody. And I think for me, I had to sort of recalibrate the way I think about things. And rather than thinking that suffering is something to be avoided, how could suffering bring compassion? And even then, I thought, you know, Aristotle would re probably respond to that too. So how does suffering bring character? And how does suffering not bring character to certain people? But it's a decision. But all that idea of individual decision making for me came out of a Western tradition of reading literature. A very old literature in terms of its theory, like criticism, like Aristotle, and all the way to the reading Western novelists to try to understand what they were doing. 21st century novelists are, are really different and of course, the modernists of the 20th century, whether it's like Wolf or T.S. Eliot, they're all different too in terms of the way they express story. But I'm still stuck in the 19th century. So uh, as a follow-up to what you just said, um, what is redemptive in, in Pachinko? Uh, is it the resilience uh, uh, with which Sanja lives her ordinary life? Is it something larger? Uh, how would you define what is or is not redemptive in Pachinko? For me, the redemption comes from the fact that we can love in the face of being hated. That decision to continue to be engaged with people who are hostile to you, to have a nation that is hostile to you and that you persist, and that you teach your children not to hate, that is extraordinary. 
because I think about this as a child and also as a parent. So I remember my father used to say to me that you, you're going to have to work harder. You're just going to have to work harder. You have a foreign name. <laughs> we don't have much. You're going to have to study harder. You're going to have to just show up faster. You have to do a, a lot of things. He didn't tell me the world is unfair, give up. He just said the world is unfair, absolutely, but these are things that you're going to have to do. And he also said, you're a woman. Girls are going to have to do things differently. And there were different prescriptions. So I remember when I had um, my, my husband's here, our son, like, I was constantly thinking, what's it going to be like for him to walk around being an Asian American male? In some ways, he gets pluses, and in some ways, he gets minuses. And I had to deal with that. But I did talk to him about it in the same way my father talked to me. I didn't avoid the issue. I just said, we're just going to face it because you're going to have to face it. And I've talked to my friends who are African-American mothers about their sons and their daughters. And that when the way that we raise our children has a lot to do with the fact that they can expect certain things. And I have friends who are white and working class. What they can expect are children who are differently able. Like, there's so many different ways you can parent. But a lot of it a, a com comes out of protection. And I think that for me, the redemption in Pachinko comes from the fact that not that everything works out beautifully in the end, but rather we accept things and that we still choose to make a home. And we're not going to be filled with hatred. Because I think that's a decision. Hello, um, I'm Angelina, I'm a first year, and I had a question about Phoebe, the uh, Korean-American girl who uh, breaks up with um, Solomon at the end. Was she sort of a projection of something you saw in the West where it was very hard to connect with Korean, uh, Japanese in the East, or that sort of attitude of not feeling, having like a similar background in terms that their parents all left Korea during World War II, but having very different experiences growing up and then not being able to kind of join together in a sense. What's her name? Angelina. Angelina. So guess what? Phoebe is you. <laughs> <laughs> Phoebe is you, and I, and I don't mean that in a joke. Like really, she's you. I wanted her to have all the questions that you would have. Because if you go to Japan, you're going, what? What do you mean there's three different kinds of Koreans? <laughs> what do you mean that my blood counts against me? And I don't mean that you're Korean, but this whole, because I think all of us, because we're educated and we live in an advanced economy and we live, for now, a democracy, um, <laughs> I still believe in democracy. <laughs> I think we're really surprised when people are treated in an inferior way, and we think that things are inequitable. So we get angry about it. And I wanted Phoebe to have all those questions. So she stands in for all of us. Because when people go to Japan, they're really surprised. Because Japan's a great country. It is a great country. It's got so many cool things. I encourage all of you to visit. I have family in Japan. So you guys should go. But then you see this sort of seamy underbelly once in a while, and you're going, oh, right. In the same way we have that in America, we have terrible things in this country. And I don't know, there is no nation I love more than America, truly. And yet we have lots and lots of problems. But I wanted the person who's coming in to ask these questions, and Phoebe stands in for that. Because for me, I really write based on ideas. Like, there are a lot of fiction writers who'll say, oh, I heard a song, and it triggered a memory. Or they'll say, I saw, you know, I, I, I smelled something, or, they have an image. Those are great ways to start a story. I always start with an idea. And then I try to figure out how will these folks talk about this idea? What will I learn from this idea? And I always have a thesis statement. So my thesis statement for both of my books are the first line. So the first line of my book is history has failed us. Us, all of us. I don't mean the Korean Japanese. But no matter. And that's my thesis. But I began with this idea that what do we do with the fact that history is so fucked up? Right? And how many of us really get to participate in history? How many of us were being asked to testify in front of Congress today? Right? That the reason why we can't not look at some of these things is because we were thinking, what would it be like to go up there and tell the story and to be terrified and to have the whole world dox you because you said this thing that you truly believed? And I, wanted my, I want my characters, and I want all of us, to have, 
to participate in this. And I do think the 19th century writers, because they wrote big novels of scope and of social realism, they did have different members saying things that we all had questions about. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Katie. I'm a first year, and I wanted to know, are there any concepts, ideas, or plot points you edited out or wish you had added in to Pachinko? And if so, why? Oh, what is your name? Katie. Katie. So Katie's question is, if I left out or could have added in plot points. So I started this novel when I was 19. And it came about because, again, I was not going to classes when I was in college. <laughs> and I went to a talk, and this American missionary came and gave this talk. And I was really moved by a story that he told. And that story just sort of stuck in my brain. And then I became obsessed with the Korean Japanese. I still majored in history. I still went to law school. Um, my friend Karen is here who got me my first job. Thank you, Karen. And she's a Wellesley resident, <laughs> she and Brian. But I mentioned that because I had this whole other life. I never thought I was going to be a fiction writer. Like, that's crazy. You can't make any money doing that. <laughs> and you can't. <laughs> and, but I just like, thought, OK, I'm really interested in this. So I, I did continue to study it. And then I went to law school, and then I quit being a lawyer after two years. And I thought, oh, I'm just going to write a book because it can't be that hard. And then in 96, I started a novel about the Korean Japanese, and I did all this research, and I learned everything I possibly could, because when I was 19, I attended a lecture, like you're attending, Katie. Are you 19? Yes. Yes. I, I hope to God that your life is not doomed by something you heard from, from me today. Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> so I'll try to keep it neutral. <laughs> and then afterwards, I you know, wrote this whole thing between 96 to 2003, and the book was called Motherland. And then I, I abandoned it because it wasn't very good. And then I started Free Food for Millionaires. So Free Food for Millionaires, my first novel, is my first published novel, but it's my third actual novel. So going back to your question about plot lines, I wouldn't add a word or take away a word from Pachinko. I have worked on this book for such a long time. And I'm so glad it's done. <laughs> Hello. My name is Sharon Shin. I'm a sophomore, and I um, am planning to major in English with creative writing. So I just wanted to ask you um, what sort of advice you would like to give to us, the audience, especially young women writers of color. Um, just your two cents, please. Um, you're going to have a wish because you are going, you are getting an elite education. You are getting a world-class elite education filled with really brilliant people who are going to tell you, look at these constant works, this is what you should, you know, read and know, and you're going to feel overwhelmed. And I don't want you to feel overwhelmed. I want you to listen to the fact that when professors give you syllabi, it's the distillation of them having read at least three, 400 books. And they're telling you, look at these six books. So if you think about it that way, those six books, the reason why they're impressive to you is because they were culled from 300. Does that make sense? Now, having said that, you're going to be like, OK, so I'm a young writer, and I want to do something. And here I am looking at Anna Karenina. Holy shit, what am I going to do? <laughs> and this is what I'm going to tell you that you should do. I want you to figure out what you care about. I want you to find questions that you feel like you have to figure out the answer no matter what. Even if it makes you no money. Even if people mock you for wanting to do something that seems completely foolish. I want you to find the question. And I want you to approach it the way you would if you wanted someone to love you. Like, I want this to be a passion. So for example, and passion is not the right word. Like, so for example, like, let's say you're in love with someone. And you really, and I'm sorry if I'm being heterosexist, but like, let's say it's a he. 
and he, his name is Peter. And you want, <laughs> why not? Oh, is he? <laughs> and he's a student at BU. Okay. Okay. And he's adorable. And you met him once, right? And Sharon wants Peter to pay attention to you, right? Sharon, you want Peter to look at you. You want Peter to desire you. Totally laudable goals. I had those wishes at your age. I have those wishes now, not with Peter. <laughs> what will you do to get Peter to love you? What wouldn't you do to get Peter to love you? I want you to frame your question in terms of that kind of intensity. Wouldn't you wake up early in the morning, right, to go to the gym? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I guess. Wouldn't you take the little bit of pocket money that you have to get a cute top if you knew that Peter was going to be at the dance? I want you to care that much. And if your topic of the thing that you're working on, your story, your essay, your book, doesn't have that level of Peter, find another question. Because otherwise, everything else is about trying to impress somebody, whether it's your teacher or your peers. And I'm going to tell you, that's going to last you about 30 minutes. And that's when you're going to be like, I'm going to order some pizza and avoid my work, right? Because if it was about Peter, you wouldn't order a pizza and avoid your work. You'd be like, oh my god, I might see Peter. This is so exciting. <laughs> I'm sorry again for being heterosexist. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.